It is just afternoon, a little Ravens lunch hour live stream on deck for you here on Thursday, April 11th of 2024. We're two weeks out from the 2024 NFL Draft. We're glad you're with us. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside Sarah Ellison. As always, this live stream is brought to you by our friends at Mantis Sleep. Lots to discuss. We'll begin with some recent comments uh, from the Club Shea Shea podcast, Shannon Sharp, former Raven, who sat down with former NFL quarterback, and I don't know if he's like officially retired yet. I would have to think based on some of the the the, the clips that have gone viral from this this interview that he is not retired and he would love to make an NFL comeback, but I just don't think anybody's calling right now. Anyway, he made a big, he's, bold statement. I was about to say he's got his own show, but so does Marlon Humphrey. So I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think so. So we'll we'll share a couple different snippets of what Cam had to say about Lamar Jackson. And he said it without hesitation. We'll also talk about what's now been finalized, even though it's um, unconfirmed by the the team, the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Deontay Hardy, according to multiple national reports, is being signed by the Ravens. So we'll talk about what the significance of that is, if at all. More details on Terrell Suggs' recent arrest. OJ Simpson passes away. Busy news cycle today, but we'll begin with Uh, The former MVP quarterback, Cam Newton, talking about Lamar, Sarah. Yeah, so as you said, he went on Club Shea Shea, and and we're going to focus on a clip that that started with this question, right? So who wins the Super Bowl first? Uh, Jordan Love, Brock Purdy, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Jalen Hurts. And when I tell you that Cam Newton did not hesitate with his answer – just take a listen to this. Who do you think wins the court, uh, wins the Super Bowl first? Jordan Love, Brock Purdy, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Jalen Hurts. Lamar. <laughs> it's just like, doesn't even take a breath, doesn't need to look up, doesn't need to look down. It's Lamar. And Bobby, one thing as, as people always criticize Lamar and not winning a Super Bowl yet, in this uh, Patrick Mahomes era... <laughs> Not many have. I mean, this list right here, he doesn't even have Josh Allen on this list, mm-hmm. which is interesting, yeah. um, who also hasn't won. But it's like all these quarterbacks have fallen to Mahomes if if they've even made it to him in in that in a head-to-head game in the playoffs. Some mm-hmm. some don't even make it. Lamar just fell to him this last year. So, But I love it. I love Cam is not hesitating. He picks Lamar, as would I. Um, well, what my, my first ahead. thought when I saw the list and heard it was that uh, two of these quarterbacks have already been to a Super Bowl, have already competed for a Super Bowl and lost. Mm-hmm. That's Brock Purdy and Jalen Hurts. Now, so and Joe Burrow. I'm sorry, and, and Burrow. Yeah. Um, Purdy lost right. to Mahomes. Burrow lost to Mahomes. That's right. Josh that's Allen right. lost to Mahomes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. So three of these, yeah, three of these names have already been to a Super Bowl, and yet there was zero hesitation. Now, <laughs> so just because you went once doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go back, right. right? Right. But without without hesitation. But I think what we're about to discuss these next couple clips, I think Cam is so spot on in terms of the way that he's viewing the Ravens. And I can't wait to have a conversation about this. So I'll let you. So drive that, it. yeah, that that like um, sets up begs the question, right? So if if Lamar has this narrative around him that he can't win the Super Bowl, which is then that's that's the narrative for just about everybody, by the way, <laughs> that's fallen to Mahomes or like an Aaron Rodgers is out of it because you know he's been around for a minute or whatever. You could pick a couple more like that, but so if if it's without hesitation, Lamar naturally Shannon Sharp, Sharp falls up with the question that I think a lot of on a lot of people's mind, then, then what's happening if you're so certain it's Lamar and let's look back at 2023, Shannon says, he says, it seemed like everything was set up perfectly for the Ra- Ravens. They have the home field advantage. They are not just beating, but just running over playoff teams from the 49ers to the to Miami Dolphins, Seattle Seahawks, the Rams, Detroit. I mean, just so many playoff teams. So he's like, what do they have to do to get over this hump? And his first answer was for both Lamar and the team. And to your point, I agree that it was uh, spot on. Even though I've seen the organization do it in the past, 
I haven't seen it as much in the Lamar era. I think one thing that Lamar and the Ravens organization just has to figure out is how to win the ugly games. Mm -hmm. It's one of them situations like sometimes when I look at Lamar, it's like, bro, you just stop thinking. And it's easy for a guy with that much talent to think. Oh, it, it's so many, like, as a chef, you can prepare this meal in so many different ways. But everybody know your signature Signature is smoked. Man, smoke this mother and get, and, and get on about your day. You got to win. Find a way to win the ugly games. Right. And we can talk about the other stuff later. Patrick Mahomes has found a way to do that. Right. I don't care what we need to do. Or we could talk about all this other, them drop balls. We can worry about all that after the end of the game. Let's find a way to win. Travis Kelsey, man, we're going to find a way to win. And I think for Lamar, once he figures that out, not to say that he hasn't, but everybody around, because it's just not Lamar. Right. It's everybody finding a way to win. That's what made Tom Brady and the New England Patriots so dynamic. Because it could be, we're going to find a way to win. Remember that Super Bowl in Atlanta? That was the ugliest Super Bowl ever. Yes. The Patriots versus the Rams. Mm -hmm. Low score. We thought it was going to be a fire. Uh, 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 Up and down. 35-31. Uh, man, it was, it 13 was a to three. Low, low scoring game. We got to find a way to win. And once he figures that out, the organization figures that out. What did you like about that, Bobby? Well couple different things and a couple different seasons that come to mind as, as as he's talking about that this past one and the 2019 season and while there were key differences between the two there were also some similarities and the one headliner is that they just mauled through the competition and route to the playoffs and the number one top overall seeds both years right not a lot of gritty okay gritty's maybe not the right word not a lot of closely contested, come from behind, winning, ugly to use Cam's word, wins. And sometimes in the playoffs, when you don't have your play caller firing on all cylinders or when you don't have, you know, ball security it comes comes to be an issue the way that it, that the way that it was, um, whether it was at the goal line or whether it was throwing into triple coverage, in that AFC championship game, you're going to have to overcome those things. And winning ugly sometimes comes along with not playing at your best, but you find a way, right? Whether it's special teams, whether it's between the lines, after the, whatever it is. And so I just, I, I appreciated that sentiment from a guy who has been there, done that, unfortunately never reached the, the pinnacle of the sport, played for one, did not win a Super Bowl but somebody who gets it. Now, I don't think he meant to single out Lamar as much. Remember, in this, the, towards the end of that first clip, he goes back to be like, and the team has to figure this out as well. It's not just Lamar. Mm -hmm. Now, Lamar is going to get singled out because he's the franchise quarterback. But I really think that there's something to be said, and, and the proof is in the pudding with those two seasons that we've seen. Utter dominance. And utter dominance throughout flashes, well, not in the divisional round in 2019, but some pretty damn good, dom excuse my French, dominance in this past year en route to the, the, um, the AFC Championship game. You look at the second half against Houston, right? Not necessarily. It was an ugly game against Kansas City, and the Chiefs found a way to win. That's what the Ravens are still searching for when everything's on the line. Yeah, so just to point out, because you kind of pointed out there, the, 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 the disclaimer behind this episode, right, because we're focusing so much on the AFC Championship game, We've done episodes where we went deep into what went what went wrong in that game. And we talked about coaching. We talked about the fumble from Zay Flowers. Like, we went down the list. And I remember after the game, I tweeted out like 11 different reasons why the Ravens lost that game. In this episode, with a an MVP quarterback, we're zeroing in on Lamar, but that doesn't mean that Lamar is the only reason why they lost the game. You know what I mean? So sure. that's, that's the disclaimer. Now, the, the second thing, when I think of like definitional winning ugly games last year, nobody epitomized that more than the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
because to a sense to a, to a certain extent the Chiefs as well. But for me, for me, it was the Steelers because I would be watching them play, and I'd be like, "This team stinks." The offense did. It stinks. And they would just hang around, hang around, hang around and wait for you to make a mistake. And then suddenly they capitalize. And that was also, I feel like what the Ravens did in all those early, like early rookie, rookie contract years of Joe Flacco, Mm -hmm. because it was kind of, um, and because you had so many veterans on defense, they understood this, this, ugly winning thing as well as cam newton is expressing it you know it was it was back in that 2012 year that it was the the almost like slogan that came out of that season even though it wasn't like it was just it was just a raw slogan it came out of it and joe and or john harbaugh and ray lewis and all those guys would always say it wasn't pretty but it was us you know and it was there were so many times that it was just like Holy cow. I can't believe you got out of that game. Like that was just a, you didn't, it's one of those where you're like, you had no business winning that game. That's an ugly win. When you have no business winning based off of the way you played. And that's why cam right there is like, we'll talk about the, the drop balls later. We'll do that after the game. During the game, you don't flinch because that's part of ugly football. You don't, you, you stare it ugly in the eye and you embrace it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. And let it agitate you. And, um, and that's what, that's what the Steelers do. They wait and wait and wait and wait until somebody else panics while they're embracing the ugly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now that's not fun as a fan. Believe me, I would prefer, I, I love the Lamar era. It is 2019 was so much fun. This last year was so much fun until that NFC champion or AFC championship game. And it, it just rips your heart out. But it's fun to do that. And by the way, winning ugly doesn't mean winning close games. The Ravens have done that. The Rams game is the perfect um, example of that, right? It was a close game that was won in overtime. But the Ravens went out and won it. Tylen, went out, Tylen Wallace went out and won it, right? It wasn't one of those, we're just going to wait for you to make a mistake and then we'll capitalize. Like, he went out and, and won that. And it was, it was back and forth and it was fun. Um, do you equate, sorry to interrupt, do do you equate high scoring games to winning ugly? No, I feel like those are, I mean, it could be ugly on the defensive side, but right. Because I'm looking at it. That's like pretty, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yet, and yet that game that you're referencing was 37 to 31. I see a lot of people referencing that as well in the live chat. Okay. I'm not reading, but I'm not reading the comments, but, but but winning close does not mean winning ugly. Yeah, for sure. The close, the close games. Like I, I mean, I remember that that game where the Chiefs and the Bills went back and forth in the Super Bowl, and then you know they won in overtime, and they ended up changing the overtime rules because of it. That was a fun game, and it was close. Winning, winning pretty doesn't necessarily only mean winning by you know double digits. You know, because those are fun, pretty games to watch. It, it no winning ugly means that you played like crap for the majority of the game. I'm talking about on offense because that's what we're focusing on right now, and somehow you still pulled it out in the end. That's that to me is winning ugly, and you got to embrace that. You got to embrace that. And so, and so if you throw uh, a, an interception, if 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 Zay Flowers has another fumble. You don't flinch. You don't let it get to you. It's like, well, it looks like today's game plan is to win ugly. <laughs> it's not to get. It's not to get frustrated. Yeah. Okay. By the way, that that Chiefs Bills game that you were referencing, I think it was in the playoffs, right? Years, oh, that was that ago. was no, it was the AFC Championship game. It AFC could be the Super Bowl, game. obviously. That's yeah, right. Because they because yeah. they're two AFC teams. But that was sensational, yeah. right? It had a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun game, and for each offensive side, that was a that was a fun, pretty game. Right. You know, on the defensive side, it was ugly. So that to me is the definition of winning ugly is when everything is going wrong and you still figure out a way to pull it out in the end. Because again, as you talked about outside of that first quarter against the Ravens in the AFC championship game, outside of that first quarter, 
the Chiefs were not looking great. For sure. Yeah. That was an ugly win. That was an that ugly was an win. Ugly win for Kansas City. You know, what what ugly games? I know I just kind of compared 23 to 19 in, in, in the utter dominance, but as some are picking up on the live chat, there were some losses this past year that qualified as ugly for the Ravens, right? The Indianapolis game comes to mind, mm -hmm. right? That was an ugly loss. So it can certainly go both ways. I remember it was a rainy day too, and that they went to overtime, right? Gardner Minshew was st was either starting or inserted into the game. Did they take out? And they did. They knocked Anthony Richardson out of that game, their rookie. Gardner Minshew comes in yeah. and just finds a way to win. Now the Ravens, you could probably make the argument, gave Indianapolis that game. Well, it's the same as, as the – there's a couple of Steelers games like that, again, oh. where it's ugly for oh. the Ravens, but it's an it's an ugly win for yeah. them. That's why I'm for saying sure. it's the Steelers. It's just like nonstop you watch them and you're like, you guys stink. And yet, and then they, they made the playoffs though, you know, yeah. again, talking about the offense. Okay. Yeah. So then they, they kind of move, move forward from the, the ugly kind of part of the conversation. And then I really, really enjoyed this next part where, um, what it means for Lamar specifically of like how he needs to approach these types of games. And this is where we get into the new kind of phrase of like, compartmentalizing different versions of yourself. I really enjoyed this. Here we go. You say that is like finding ways to win mm -hmm. that people don't think you can because everybody thinks that he's supposed to throw for three, 400 yards and that's the only way they can win. Right. But sometimes he turned into a game manager because he, Tom Brady was the greatest game manager and the greatest Sorry. because he understood, man, this is going to be a low scoring game, man. I can't put this ball in harm's way. Right. I can't fumble. I can't make mistakes. Or knowing how to compartmentalize the different versions of yourself. And that's what makes you a game changer. Because it may say, hey, 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 easy, easy, easy. Hey, check, check, check. Hey, Bronco, hey, Bronco. Hey, 52 is the mic. That's checking into a, a run play. Right. It's too high. I know what it is. I want to take this shot. We're calling two plays. Right. This second and short or third and one, we're going to be aggressive. Okay, hey, 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 easy. Hey, I got to get us out this play. First down, one yard gain. Cool, that's fine. I need to understand what version of myself that I need to go into my deck of cards and say, okay, boom, I'm going to throw that little, that little ten of spade out. It's going to walk, though. Right. You dig what I'm saying? Right. So each, so each game, a quarterback, Cam Newton has to go in there. I have to be the best version today of what is needed of me today. I might not need to be Superman today. Put a microscope to it and even this play. Okay. Not today. Because out of, out of, in, in a given game, you may have anywhere from 45 plays to 62 plays. That's just been documented. What a regular game for an offense may look like. Those those plays, each play will never look the same. These are what the outside pundits don't realize. It's a chess match. And too many times, people forget that. Okay, so so here's here's what I like. What I hear Cam Newton saying is Lamar. On some of these plays, take the layup. Take the layup. Um, become Spread a game. the burden. Spread the burden. Take off the cape. Be, take off the cape. Now, <laughs> become a game manager. And I feel like it's another version of what we've been saying since we had Steve Young. Those, those on schedule type things. Like, it's just easy dump. You take it. Quick, quick, quick drop. Boom. There's, there's Rashad Bateman. Yeah. Boom. There's Zay Flowers. Boom. There's my running back coming out of the back. Like just, just easy, 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 easy. Take the laps. Now he's also saying though, within that, he's like, all right, you may have a play called where you are just like third and one, but you get to the line of scrimmage. And you're like, Oh, mm -hmm. there's a shot I can take right now. All right. All right. Audible, you know? Or your coordinator has put in that you're going to take a shot. You get to the line of scrimmage. It's like, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Let me just take three yards instead. And I'm yeah. going to kill it. I'm going to kill it. And so um, there definitely was a feeling, and and I understand it, we were all with it because Todd Munkin comes in 
and we're leaving behind the Greg Roman era. And it's like, Lamar can do more than run. And he can pass. We can pass too. And I feel like the Ravens proved that. They can do that. And to play with that a little bit and to grow like that might be fun in the regular season. But once those playoff games come around, it's time to like, when he said that Lamar's thinking, I was like, I wonder what he means by that. Because sometimes you can see people thinking, but uh, like, of course you have to think, cause he's sitting there telling you, you got to look at the line of scrimmage and either kill a play that's and potentially kill plays. But I wonder, I wonder if the thinking is like, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to prove, I'm going to prove this. I can prove that. You know what I mean? And it was just like, that's the way that game felt. It was just like, we're going to, we're going to prove, we're going to prove that we can win by, by throwing for 300, 400 yards, you know, 350. And so, so, so I don't know. I don't know. I would love to do a follow-up question on that, but, but that's it. Take the layups and, and most quarterbacks can't become Superman. Lamar can. So it's easier, as Mike Tomlin always says, to teach a player to say, it's easier to say, whoa, than go. Lamar, we know he can go. We know you can be Superman. So this is much easier. Whoa. Just take, just take this two yard dump off. Just take it. Take that, take that layup. One thing I was reminded of listening to that clip is how much of a savant Cam Newton is. He's well studied. He understands this game unlike anybody else or just as good as anybody who's who's played and I think he does a good job of articulating that remember he he was the guy who sparked the game manager debate if you will surrounding Brock Purdy Mm, which put it which really sent that topic that discourse through the roof on social media and throughout all NFL circles for much of last year And uh, regardless of what you think about Brock, I don't think Cam in any way meant anything demeaning about that. He was just looking at the situation that Brock has been put in in San Francisco, taking note of what's around him, taking note of what Kyle Shanahan asks of him, and giving his opinion as a former quarterback. I love the the, the compartmentalized comment, like you mentioned, too, because Lamar's proven that he can wear a number of different hats. Mm -hmm. And if he could probably wear more hats than almost anybody in the league, minus Mahomes, right? (laughs) Last year proved that. Yeah. He can operate and have success and function and thrive in a pro style offense. The way he did under Bobby Petrino en route to a Heisman trophy at Louisville. He can do that at the next level. And so what we saw last year was not only the development the versatility, um, also just the potential with, with this high flying offense. But you also saw that, yeah, he is able to spread the burden. He is able to function in a completely different role than what he had asked to be, had been asked to be through his previous five seasons. And so just last to, year. yeah. And so just to put some numbers behind this, um, I remember Ian Hart, Hart Hartitz had put this tweet out, um, the week after these AFC championship games and he, and he showed the average target depth in the AFC and NFC championship games, the average target depth for Patrick Mahomes was 5.9 yards. Hmm. Jared Goff, 9.5, 9.4. I mean, Brock Purdy 10 and then Lamar was the most at 10.8. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're, yeah. So, and then, and then when you look at, um, this is the next gen stats of their passing charts. I counted here, Patrick Mahomes in that game completed one, two, three, four. There's a big, I think there's four in there. So that might be eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 passes behind the line of scrimmage. That that looks like the area where he completed the most passes that game. Yeah. And then there were, you know, the next majority is just within five yards of the, of the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Lamar had, I'm counting here, three passes behind the line of scrimmage, one more right on it, 13 to three. It looks like Mahomes has beyond 10 yards, one, two, three, four attempts. He hit two of the four. Lamar has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 
Yep. So Mahomes is like, all right, I'm just going to win ugly today. I'd love to know how much, how many of these were designed screens in Kansas City's game. Yeah. Because because they run it better than the Ravens do. The Ravens got better at it, but I think a lot of people, (laughs) a lot of teams do, (laughs) a lot of teams do. But look at that. I mean, that's so abundantly clear. Yeah, and that, then this is just Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Look at that. <laughs> Look right. at that. Like right. 90-some-odd percent right there yep. at the line of scrimmage. And this is Henry McKenna. He he says, here's Patrick Mahomes' passing chart in the Super Bowl. Short pass king, check down Warriors, game manager. It was a terrific game. <laughs> yep. Yep. So anyway, and sometimes, by the way, the layup is just handing the ball off and letting like and, – and here's what's funny. Here I will say this. I don't want to regress back to, to the the Roman years. We don't want to go that far back, okay? But maybe the Ravens try to go a little too far the other way and didn't didn't really and, and forgot their bread and butter right in that last game. Here's here's the thing: when we talk about winning ugly, enter Derrick Henry. This guy, he's going to help the Ravens win ugly. Yeah, he'll be a part. Let's of the just formula. go run people over. Take three three times three runs. You know, or you know, two runs and a quick dump off or whatever, and just churn out these ten yard things and just make these defensives pay. Just make them pay. Go ahead. Let's bring in Derrick Henry and win ugly. Let's go. He'll be a part of the formula for sure on a number of levels in that new look offense uh, come this fall. Before we get to the the reported signing that came down the timeline yesterday, and that is Deontay Hardy. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Mantis Sleep. Sarah and I and Sarah's family. Big fans of the Manta Sleep Mask Pro. Gives you true 100% blackout for a deeper sleep. C-shaped eye cups for unbeatable side sleep comfort. Zero pressures uh, applied on your eyelids or lashes. It's built with advanced materials and ventilation for unmatched breathability. Again, what you're seeing on the screen here is the Manta Sleep Mask Pro. You can go to mantasleep.com right now. And at checkout, if you use code VAULT10, that's discount code Vault 10. You'll get 10% off your next purchase. I always like to show you. This is the one that I wear every single night. So regardless if it's deep sleep, cat naps on a weekend, whatever it is, attaches easily, doesn't necessarily apply any kind of pressure. So it's easy to sleep, doesn't give you headaches or anything. And we're uh, very thankful that Mantha Sleep believes in our channel and wants to sponsor us here in the offseason as we get ready for the NFL draft. So mantasleep.com, we have a link in the show notes below if you want to get started today. This came down yesterday, partner. One of the guys that we had heard about was visiting the Ravens and sort of that veteran, free, unrestricted free agent wide receiver mold. We know that they looked at Michael Gallup, who remains available. We know they looked at Josh Reynolds, who ended up signing elsewhere. And now, according to NFL Network, former All-Pro return man, and Devin, Devin Duvernay is a former All-Pro as well, so this could potentially be his front-runner replacement. He's also a wide receiver, Deontay Hardy, signing with the Ravens. It's a one-year deal. Tom Pelissero and Ian Rappaport were all over this. Jeff Zarebek noted a few things as well. He is a Baltimore native, as we covered last week. He was a standout at Archbishop Curley here locally. He is the favorite to replace Devin Duvernay as a key special teams player uh, and their return man. And I think I have the numbers here as well. Well, even though the Ravens haven't confirmed it, Deontay has. Yeah. (laughs) He put up a purple devil emoji. quote. Well, he also um, tweeted like, Baltimore, I'm coming home. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. So he is. He's back. And here's what he's coming back on, according to Spot Rack. A one-year, $1.29 million contract. It includes $1.15 million fully guaranteed at signing. And now Baltimore heads towards the draft with around $9 million of top 51 cap space to work with. So there you have it, Sarah. What was your first reaction? We've talked about it last week. Not necessarily a needle-moving type of uh, acquisition, but probably somebody who at the very least is going to replace Devin Duvernay, who left in free agency for Jacksonville. <laughs> You speak about Devin Duvernay. Let me see if I can jump ahead here real quick. So um, this this is interesting. So Cole Jackson, friend of the show, has been on here before, reached out to a couple of uh, Buffalo um, reporters and podcasters, and, and he's like, okay, tell us uh, about about your guy, about Hardy. 
And so Anthony Cover One, who uh, does the Cover One podcast on the Bills, uh, he wrote this. He said, underwhelming. Didn't and he's speaking offensively first? Underwhelming. Didn't catch on with Dorsey or Brady last year, which isn't a good sign for him. Has speed and real juice, but wasn't utilized in an offense that needed speed and juice. Good for gadget work, return work, and can stretch the field. Can pull coverage or even get legit open downfield. Had some production early on, but that waned as the season progressed. Bobby, if if somebody had taken out the name of Dorsey from that and put in the name Duvernay, I would yeah. say that was pretty darn accurate. Pretty much. I felt like Duvernay, I remember early kind of showed some signs. He has some juice. He can go deep. He can return. Gadget work was another like, you know, kind yeah. of Duvernay um, word I would use to describe him, but then really never caught on inside the offense and was more a return man. So yeah. When you say that Ravens went out and got a replacement for Devin Duvernay, uh, that sounds like it. Now, we'll see if he has more upside. I mean, the Ravens, I'm sure. Is, has, Duver has Duvernay signed anywhere yet? Jacksonville. 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 So, did you know what's what, the, much... the rest of the Ravens? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I want to look up how much that, that, um, uh, yeah, while you do, let me, let me go through some of the stats here because I also had a um, Bills content creator on my live stream okay. yesterday, Zach Bell uh, from the Buffalo Fanatics Network, and and he kind of like reaffirmed what uh, – or reiterated, I should say, what Cole was going back and forth with that other guy about that, that really it's offensively speaking, you got to temper expectations and know that he can still be a big factor – in the return game so much. So take a look at what he did last year against the Miami dolphins. He took a 96 yard punt to the house, 96 yard punt return to the house, um, punt return. This is all next gen stat stuff. Just, just showing you that he's still got quite a bit of speed. I mean, he clocked out at maxed out at over 20 miles an hour. It added to their win probability. Um, the punt return yards over expected plus 83 through the roof. So he's, he's got a lot left in the tank in terms of athleticism, but as you saw on the previous slide and for our audio only audience, I'll just say he's never, he, he's never completed a full season, um, 16 games close a year ago in Buffalo, but in new Orleans, he was up and down 2022, only four games. You know, 2020, just nine games. So that's something that's got to be taken into account. But when you look at the the figures that Spot Rack had, it's not that much of a concern. And they'll have other options, too, when Keaton Mitchell gets back healthy if they want to continue to tinker with him as a potential returner. Yeah, so Devin DuVernay signed, as you say, with Jacksonville, two years, $8.5 million. Okay. So he's getting an average of four point two five million. The Ravens just signed Hardy for what'd you say, one point one point three basically. It's up there now, yeah. So it's uh definitely uh trying to replace him at a much cheaper cost. And um and just to compare here, Devin Duvernay has been pretty healthy his whole career, right? Um played the majority of the seasons, but uh his if you go back to to let me see here. If you go back to this slide here, so um, Hardy's biggest year was 570 yards. Biggest year for Duvernay was 2022, 407 yards. He had three touchdowns that year. Same with with Hardy, three touchdowns. So I mean, I mean, these guys seem very similar, but it, but uh, Devin seemed to be more uh, durable. So now I think the conversation that needs to be had, though, along these lines. And I don't think we've delved into it deep enough, so I, I want to do it now. We don't need to spend too, too much time on this. But being that the kickoff has been completely revamped mm -hmm. this offseason by NFL owners and voted on and approved, which will look very different and something that's been adopted by the XFL uh, from, from the XFL. Maybe Deontay Hardy and some of his traits and and and, and athleticism was a factor in in that the signing of him was a factor given the changes. Now, if you haven't been following this, here's a quick reminder on, on what the kickoff will look like specifically. And it's kind of complicated, but basically Justin Tucker and all kickers 
still kick off from their own 35, Mm -hmm. but they're alone at that spot rather than teammates within their special team units to the right and left. The other 10 players on the coverage team must have one foot on the return team's 40-yard line. Either nine or 10 of the players on the return team have to have one foot on their 35-yard line. None of those players can leave their spot until the kick is caught or hits the ground. Wow. By the way, I told you the landing zone was the uh, uh, end zone. and That's incorrect last week. The landing zone is between the goal line and the 20-yard line. So if the ball comes down within the landing zone. You can't fair catch it? It must be returned. Okay. If it's down in the end zone, it comes out to the 30. If it hits the ground before the landing zone, so again, between the goal line and the 20 yard line before that, it comes out to the 40. You guys all following <laughs> along here? You guys all following here? If it hits in the landing zone and then goes into the end zone for a touchback, it comes out to the 20. Moral of the story, okay. yes, there's a lot of words on the so screen. So they're trying right to get now. the kicker to kick it inside the field of play and not in the end zone. Oh, baby. They yeah. want offense. Yeah, they right? want it. They want, they it want fireworks. They yeah. don't want to devalue a play multiple right. times throughout a game. They don't want people getting up for a bathroom break. Right. They want you sitting down on your butts and watching every single aspect of these games. I think Deontay Hardy potentially potentially could bring the fireworks based on what he did last year, based on how strong the, the now last year was definitely an, an out, maybe a little bit of an outlier, but we all know historically how elite Raven special teams units have been. I think they try to get back to that this year. Okay. I'm just trying to, okay. So it I must, I'm <laughs> still re, I'm like rereading this thing. So if it's if it's caught between the zero and twenty, it's got to be returned. If it is downed inside the end zone, so that means Tucker hit it into the end zone. They catch it, they down it. It comes out to the thirty. If it hits the ground before the landing zone, meaning if it hits the if it hits what at the twenty five. But so so landing zone is between the goal line and the no. I know, but it's line. saying if it hits the ground before the landing zone, it yeah. comes out to the forty. Yeah. So is that like, uh, I just am trying to figure out in what scenario are you kicking it between, I mean, before the 20, do you know what I mean? Right. Maybe it's an onside kick or whatever. Maybe, yeah. Um, what would, what would a scenario be there? I mean, a botched kick. A botched. I mean, at the end, maybe there's like a couple seconds left in the half. You know, something like that. You're trying to run out the clock. Yeah. So. But if it hits in the landing zone and then goes into the end zone for a touchback, it comes out to the 20. Okay. Woo! There, we're going to have returns. Right? We're going to have returns. For sure. So, I know a couple of you had been asking about this. And to be quite honest with you, we, we've we've needed to spruce up on on what this this new wrinkle means and looks like. So, just wanted to revisit that. And... Deontay Hardy is now, again, not confirmed yet by the the team, but he will be your newest Baltimore Raven. What is the latest with Terrell Suggs? We know there's some allegations out. There's an arrest that's that's been... Yeah, so yesterday at this time, we had absolutely no idea what happened. And so um, uh, Jonah Schaefer over at the Baltimore Banner got some of the details. So I'll just read that. Uh, this is all new information for us. So... Um, yeah. Okay. Trying to get, okay. Former Raven star pass rusher trail Suggs was arrested in Arizona on Tuesday on allegations that he threatened to kill another driver and pulled out a gun at a Starbucks drive through In an email officer, Aaron Bolin, public information officer for the Scottsdale police department said Suggs was arrested on charges of threatening and intimidating and, in, and disorderly conduct with a weapon. He was booked into a jail in Maricopa County, but has since been released. Law enforcement reported that Suggs pulled up too far in the drive-thru at a Starbucks in Scottsdale where he lives. He started to back up to the ordering speaker and hit another vehicle with his Range Rover, police allege, but did not cause any damage. The other driver had a dash camera. 
He got out of his vehicle to approach Suggs. Could you imagine, by the way? This is why I would never get out of my car, side so thought. That's more. You don't know who's in the other car. Could you imagine getting out of your car and then Suggs comes out <laughs> like Listen, a former? You're rethinking linebacker? everything in that moment. It's okay? just like, why didn't I just back up? Why didn't I just back yeah. up? Get out of there. It's like soon a movie as possible. scene right there, right? Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Sorry. Okay. The other driver had a dash cam. He got out of his vehicle to approach Suggs, who then exited his SUV. They got into an argument, police assert, but the two eventually returned to their cars. Okay. As Suggs was leaving, he flipped off the other driver, police claim. The man began to swear at Suggs. Clearly, the, them getting out did not deter him. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Suggs repeatedly told the man, you want to go. The man responded with an, responded with an expletive and told Suggs to go away, police reported. Suggs then called him a, <laughs> I can't even repeat that. Go read, lot, go, go lot. read, go yeah. read the article. Called him, yeah, a lot and stated, I'll kill your BA, police allege. As Suggs was leaving the drive through investigators assert, he reached his arm through the window and showed a handgun. Suggs, though, did not point the weapon at the man who reported that he felt threatened. The man took down Suggs' license plate and reported the incident to police. Detectives identified Suggs and later arrested him during a traffic stop. During an initial appearance, Maricopa County Court Commissioner Lindsey M. Hughes asked Suggs if he was currently employed. He responded no. Uh, then they just talked about, I cut out a couple paragraphs because of going on. It was saying that they... After he was arrested, they released him. They didn't think he was a danger, all that kind of stuff. And then in a statement issued through uh, Denise White, his representative at EAG Sports, Sugg said he feared for his own safety during the argument. Quote, throughout the incident, I was the one who felt in danger while fearing I would be followed home and for the safety of my family nearby at my residence, he said. Suggs is next scheduled to appear in court on April 25th for a status conference. His preliminary hearing is scheduled for April 29th. It is not immediately clear if he's retained an attorney. So that is the update from Baltimore Banners, Jonah Schaefer. Yeah, and we'll leave it at that. We'll learn more, I'm sure, as, as that situation unfolds. But will we finally get to see the Lamar Jackson versus Lamar Jackson interview? <laughs> this was prior to him signing that we learned that maybe just maybe he was going to drop on his like YouTube channel an interview with himself, but then it never came right like, this time last year. Matter of fact, like it was happening during the negotiations, which made it such a talked about item. Yeah. Because he had been so quiet. And then it never came. But anyway, here's his Instagram story. A screenshot of a 60 minutes backdrop back with, with Lamar versus Lamar sitting down I, in the chairs. We're not we're not waiting on a contract anymore, but I would still love a Lamar on Lamar interview. That would be oh, great. Why not? why not? He's always something else. You know, this is going to get everybody clamoring online. Oh, quarterback too. is so funny. I love Goodness him. gracious. This was certainly a surprise because of how much I'd say. And I've actually followed OJ Simpson for a while since he became on social media, you know, since he kind of was on Twitter and was very active with, with videos. And I didn't even know he had cancer, but according to his family. So wait, you followed him, but he never let it be known that he had cancer. Well, what I mean by that is I hadn't seen his content. I should say, I don't, I didn't follow him and I don't follow him. It would pop up in my algorithm for whatever reason for fo from a football standpoint. Okay. And because a lot of his videos were reaction to football He'd speak from his golf cart or something, right? Yeah. And like he, yeah. And so just a couple months ago, he like denied claims that he was in hospice, but he has been dealing with cancer and he has, mm -hmm. and he had, that was known, but, but then like he went silent on social and I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. So when, when this tweet popped up from OJ's actual Twitter account today and that and the fam or I'm sorry, yeah, from from today sharing his passing yesterday on April 10th. I was just I was somewhat surprised because of how quiet he had been. Well, I guess the quiet and that go hand in hand, but I just didn't know that it was that serious. Anyway, he was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. The Simpson family, that's a statement that they put out on social media. Obviously, this has been a um 
and will continue to be a some some polarizing reaction reaction all over the map based on his past mm. uh, on social media. But OJ Simpson dead at uh, at seventy six. Seventy six. Yep. Yep. It's a long life. Right. So we'll leave it at that on that one. There's we can go in a number of different yeah, directions when it when it as it relates to OJ Simpson, and I'm sure there will be plenty of that content that you can find online but for now oj simpson is is dead at 76 this yesterday is getting worse and worse for the second soon to be second year chief rasheed rice who was a major piece to the kansas city puzzle uh, offensively en route to their super bowl back to back uh, tom pelicero of nfl network rasheed rice faces one count of aggravated assault one count of collision involving serious bodily injury and six counts of collision involving injury, all stemming from last month's high speed car crash in Dallas. Sarah, this is getting ugly and uglier for Rashid. I, I, I can't imagine, first of all, in wake of everything that took place several years ago with Henry Ruggs, the former star in, in Vegas, who was in ridiculously under the influence uh, at the time of his massive collision, who which ended up killing a young woman and her dog, uh, which was just a horrible situation. Rashi is lucky. He's so lucky that nobody was that nobody lost their lives because yeah. of this decision, yeah. and and all for the thrill of and a dopamine hit of what thirty seconds. He's now putting other people's lives in jeopardy. He's putting his football career in jeopardy. I mean, you could talk about this season and what's expected and what's not expected. He's just got to hope that he has a football career left in him. He might he might spend this upcoming season in jail. We'll have to see how this plays out. It's crazy, Bobby, because we've had like back to back to back three stories of just like from Rasheed Rice to, you know, OJ Simpson and obviously his past and uh, and then Terrell Suggs, and it's just like, it's just a reminder, like, decisions can change everything. Decisions can change everything. Right. Like, like you said with this, it's like, like, I try to tell this to my kids all the time, like, the risk is not worth the reward. Yep. Like, the risk that you're putting, you know, on a highway for the reward, like you said, kind of like a dopamine hit or whatever it is to like be speeding and racing or like with, with like the trail Suggs thing, uh, you know, he says he felt like his, his life was in jeopardy and all of that. And I don't know, it didn't, they didn't go into detail of what the other guy said or anything like that, but it's just like, if there's any way, if there is any way to calm down situations, OJ Simpson and like there's any way to calm down situations. That's the way to go. Like bring it down. Right? Cause like once you start hearing that, you know, like in Suggs's case that like a gun is being waved and this and that, it's just like things can turn South quick. It can turn quick. Yep. And I just remember all the times, all the times that Ray Rice has spoken to kids or spoken at football programs. It's just like one decision can change your life. And it's like that night, that moment, all of that, it's just not even worth it. It's not worth it. And that's really got to be behind all your decisions. Is the risk even worth the reward? There is this. And oftentimes it's not. Right. There is this element of invincibility. You're 23. You just finished up your rookie season in which you literally reached the pinnacle of your profession. One year in to your career, guys spend decades years in the NFL, years in professional sports, trying to achieve what you were fortunate fortunate enough to be a pretty significant piece to, and he did it in one year. And so there's this element of invincibility. There's this element of just recklessness that comes along with that. Yeah. And, and gosh, you, 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 I, I hope that all NFL teams – and their compliance departments, or, or, or you can tell me since you worked you worked with the team. Okay, if you were there during the Henry Ruggs incident, would John Harbaugh and his staff, in a po in a um, 
what's the what's the the uh, the auditorium the in an auditorium setting with with meeting type of style are they going to use that as an example are they going to bring that up on the screen and bring in professionals uh, to guide I, their men i've never been obviously in one of those meetings but um but yeah it's not uncommon to have like a uh, hey, we're heading into the off season <laughs> kind of yeah. talk yeah. and make good decisions kind of talk. You know, it's whether or not they bring up, you know, those specific incidents, I don't know, but they have brought back Ray Rice for those types of talks, you yeah. know, yeah. to allow him to give, you know, you know, wisdom through what he's been through. And I'll just end it on a positive. I'll try to end it on a positive note here. Like, you know, I'm sure everybody has gotten caught up in a moment, whether it's a moment of anger or passion or, or a crazy night out or whatever. And so all you can hope is, especially in this, as you said, in the Rasheed Rice incident and in trail Suggs, luckily nobody got hurt. Um, is you look at it and you're like, Whoa, look how close I came. And you hopefully right. use that to become better. I'm gonna be better. And, you know, in my view, you know, just about everybody, I mean, is worthy of redemption. If you want to go out and get it, go out and get it, go out and get your redemption. You're capable of it, you know, go out and do it. And so luckily in both of these incidents, nobody got hurt. And I mean, in Rashid Rice's, there was, there was an injury, but nobody, nobody died. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, use it to get better, use it to get better and, and, you know, change things around. And Ruggs wasn't as fortunate, right? He's going to have to live mm -hmm. with that for the rest of his life, even if he does get out one day. Like, he, he, his decision took someone's life away. So, anyway, the – what's a positive way to end it on? You're right. I was, I was – I need to – I, need to <laughs> I tried to do it, Ruggs. and then you went to back to Ruggs. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. You tried your best, and I just <laughs> plummeted at us. So, we'll do this then. How about that? Because two weeks from tonight – that's classic. Two weeks from tonight. Sarah will be flying in from Columbus to join me for our inaugural marathon draft party live stream event. It's going to be at Soundstage in downtown Baltimore, right across the street from Power Plant. It will mean the world to both of us if you and yours, whether it's your daughter, son, friend, mom, dad, whatever, significant other, want to come out and join us for what will be a special night as the Ravens make their way up to the 30th overall selection in the opening round, if they stay put. 40 bucks gets you in the door, Thursday, April 25th, 7 o'clock. Catering will be provided by our friends at Clean Cuisine. Really, really good food. I hear there's going to be crab cakes. Uh, what else? Cash bar, special guests, different giveaways. Should be a fun night. Can't wait to see you, partner. Just football. Just football. That's what I care about. <laughs> I just can't wait to see what happens during the NFL draft. I want to know who the Ravens are drafting, man. I just, oh. Yep. The, the energy is going to be off, off the chart. It's going to be off the chart. I, my energy is off the chart during the draft when I'm alone in my office here. Okay. <laughs> Put us right. around a couple hundred people. It's going to be another level. It's going to be That's another level. That's why we love you. So... And my gym thought today, we'll end it on here. My gym thought was this, and we'll let the live chat answer. I love it. it. We always get a gym thought or a shower thought from you. Yep. Here we go. Sauna, gym, and shower. Those are there the three go. areas that uh, that I do my best thinking. Because you don't have your, it's because you don't have a device near you. Yeah. So you can actually think. All exactly. Right. Exactly. Today it was on the. Actually, I'm sorry. Today it was on the stairmaster. I'm on the stairmaster, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, which Alabama player? are the Ravens inevitably drafting this year? Who's it going to be? Which Alabama player? We'll let the live chat think about that, and maybe that's something you and I revisit in the coming days. So, Okay, the 11th is down. We'll the next 23 I was, hours I got to be honest. I got to yeah. be honest. With the buildup, I thought it was going to be something more than that. I thought you were going to impart some sort of wisdom, <laughs> like some sort of learning mode, some like – who are the Ravens going to draft from Alabama? Okay. <laughs> well, look, I could take you down a rabbit hole of what I've been thinking about these days, but I don't think anybody's going to want to hear that. Yeah, right, I'm all over all the right. map. Yeah, let's let's close it up. <laughs> you get that enough in our in our just catch up calls about gosh knows what. So anyway, we hope you'll join us. Tickets to our our party are available on Ticketmaster. We have a link to that in the description of this video below. Special thanks to Manta Sleep for sponsoring this episode. If you're in the market, you want to improve your sleep, or if you're in the market for a sleep mask, go to mantasleep.com and use our discount code VAULT10 
for 10% off your next purchase. So for Sarah Ellison, I'm Bobby Trotson signing off from this Thursday Ravens lunch hour live stream. We'll be back with you in 23 hours from right now.